Hey church, welcome back to HD Online. I am very glad you're joining us and uh, we are looking forward to gathering again next Sunday, November 15th. Don't forget 10 a.m. We'll be back again. We had a great time and my prayer is that you all felt comfortable. You felt like, man, we're just having church again. And so don't forget next Sunday we'll be meeting in person here. We are in part two of our new series, our November series, Better Than I Deserve. And really what what I believe God is wanting to do um, in this season, in this month, as we finish out the year, is just continue to give us more reasons to be grateful. Just continue to change the way we think and, and our perspective and continue to find um, reasons why we can be grateful. Instead of always looking at the negative or, or what's going wrong and everything that's happening in the world, listen, let me just throw this out there. We have a president, a new president, and pray for them. Pray for him. Pray for our vice president. Pray for them. All right. Let's just do that. Don't get caught up in everything going on. Let's pray for our country. Pray for each other and continue to do what God has called us to do. Remember, that has not changed. God has called us to share our faith, to preach the gospel, to, to love others, to make disciples and to serve others. So the mandate of the church um, does not change just because we have someone new in office. My encouragement to you is just to pray for those that are in office now. Let's continue to be grateful as we continue in the month of November. Better than I deserve part two. If you are taking notes, number one is this. You are noticed. There's a story in the Bible found in Luke chapter 19. And I'm going to paraphrase it for time's sake. But I really like this story. Jesus is coming in and he's teaching. And there's massive, huge crowds of people that are following him. He's become very popular and people are wanting to be around him and they're hearing about the miracles and they're hearing about you know what he's teaching about they're drawn towards him and there's a a man in the city a, a well-known man he's actually a, a tax collector his name is Zacchaeus and um, people didn't like him because of what he did tax collectors were not honest in the first century and they stole money from people. So people didn't like Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus was so excited to see Jesus. He was so excited that the Bible says that he was very short in stature. And so there was so many people that he couldn't see over everybody. And so the Bible says that he had to climb a, a tree and he climbs up on top of the tree just to get a glimpse of Jesus. And while Jesus is walking towards that tree, he looks up at Zacchaeus and he tells him, Zacchaeus, come, come down from that tree. He goes, uh, um, you've been appointed. I've been appointed to stay, to go into your house and stay with you. And Zacchaeus was so excited and um, that Jesus would even, even hang out with him because he knew himself that he wasn't a good man. And the people begin to talk about Jesus and why is he, why is he hanging out with Zacchaeus and why is, why is he, does he know who he is? He's a tax collector. He steals money from the poor. And Jesus goes into Zacchaeus' house and they have dinner together. And the Bible goes on to say in Luke chapter 19 verses 9 and 10, because Zacchaeus begins to become remorseful and repent towards Jesus. And he basically says, and I'm paraphrasing it, you guys can read it on your own. He basically says, look, I'm going to pay everybody back. Everyone that I stole from, Lord, I want to pay everyone back. And Jesus says to him in Luke 19, 9 and 10, he said, Jesus said to him, this shows that today life has come to you and your household. For you are a true son of Abraham. The son of man has come to seek out. I love this part. The son of man has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. Jesus wastes no time at recognizing, listening, and noticing those who feel like they're unnoticed. Jesus does not discriminate against anyone. And maybe there's some of you watching that are listening. Maybe you've, you've kind of felt like that. Maybe you felt like you've been overlooked or you've been passed up or you've been maybe mistreated, forgotten, abused ashamed or even hurt and you feel like God has not noticed you. I just want to encourage you more reasons to be grateful is that God notices you, that God will go out of his way just to find you, to seek you. Those that are lost, he will find. In John chapter four, we find a, another situation of God noticing someone when, when Jesus goes in a different direction away from the disciples and he comes into a city and he stops at a well and he finds a woman sitting at the well. And we all know this story as the woman 
at the well, and Jesus begins to have this conversation with her. And once again, I will paraphrase for time's sake, but Jesus just begins to minister to her while also calling her out on her life. And the direction that her life was going was not good. The Bible says Jesus begins to ask where her husband is. And um, she says, well, I have no husband. And I believe she said, uh, Jesus says, yeah, that's right. You've had like four or five husbands. And the man you're with now is not even your husband. And so she's like, man, how do you know all these things? And they have this conversation about how to worship God. And she's saying that, you know, the Messiah is going to come. And Jesus tells her, I am the Messiah. And so she leaves that place totally changed and transformed because this man knew everything about her. Jesus goes out of his way to find people that feel like no one will ever notice them. The reason she was out there at the well in the middle of the day is because she did not want to be seen by anybody because she already had a reputation that was not good. She was already hurt, ashamed, broken, lost, confused, overlooked. Here's another person that God comes in and says, I notice you. Amen. When nobody else notices you, I notice you. I love you. I'll find you. I'll meet you at the place where you're trying to hide. I'll meet you there and I'll pull you out and I'll love you like no one else has loved you before. Church, you are noticed by God. And you need to remind yourself of that every single day. Another reason to be grateful is that God notices you. I was sitting down just the other day and I was with someone um, that that I know and I and I won't I don't want to get into detail, but I, I just I was just looking at their life and I was sitting with them. And I was looking at their life and my heart went out to them because they're at a place in their life where I already know they don't feel good about themselves. They don't have confidence. They feel like their life is not going in a good direction. And it just my, my heart went out to them because I had compassion for them because it reminded me of myself in a moment in time in my life where I felt like like like. God, you're, there's no way you're noticing me. There's no way you're going to use me. There's no way you're going to rescue me. I've already made too many mistakes. God, I'm, I'm no good to you. And I begin to see that same feeling in the person that I was looking at because it reminded me of myself. And I begin to just think to myself, that person needs to know that, that they are noticed, that God does love them, that it's not too late to serve God, that God can turn their life around, that, that it's okay. That you might be in a season right now that's difficult, dark, where you feel lost and hopeless, where you don't have any confidence. But in just one word from God can change you. Amen. Just one moment in the presence of God can radically transform your life. And that is the goodness of God. Church, the fact that God sees you at your worst and still accepts you with His best is proof that He is good. And I want you to know, church, that you are noticed by God. If nobody else notices you, if you feel like you've been overlooked or you've been passed up or you feel like your life has just been, there's been too many ups and downs. It's been too much of a roller coaster and you feel like there's too much pain. There's too much hurt. There's too much shame. I just want you to know that God sees right through that. That you might have layers of your life, of those things that are, that are hindering you from moving forward with God. But God says that I can come in and I can restore and I can rehabilitate and I can rescue you and I can propel you to a new life in me. That's what God says. So know this church, you are noticed. Another reason to be grateful is that God notices you. Number two is this. You are missed. This is another thing that I know that we think at times where maybe you've walked away from God or maybe you're running from God or maybe you were serving God at, at one point and, and, and you, you fell short and you sinned or you made a mistake. And so now maybe you feel like you want to give up and now you feel that you're unworthy and you're, you don't want to have to continue to go back to God over and over again. But I want you to know that when those things happen, when you are away from God or you turn away from God or you're running from God or where you, when you do fall short, what I want you to know is that God loves you so much that he misses you. This is, this is a, it's a good feeling when not only somebody notices you, but when they notice you when you're gone and they tell you, hey, we've missed you. 
We haven't seen you in a while. Haven't seen you in a while. It feels good when people, when people love you at that level where, where they do notice that you're not here, where they do notice that you're gone, where they do notice that something's wrong or something's off and someone comes up to you and tells you, hey, I, I haven't seen you. I just want you to know that I miss you. God is just like that and, and much more than that. He's way more than that. The Bible says that God is love. And, and listen, God is full of patience. The Bible says that God desires us, that he's not slow to fulfill his promises, but, but he, 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 he delays the return of Jesus because he loves everyone so much that he desires, God desires them to come to repentance. That's what the Bible says. And the scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, it says, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it, the Bible says. We've all been there. All of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. I know we've all been there, church. Well, we've made choices because we've been selfish, we've been sinful, because temptation has overtaken us. The Bible is telling us that we've all been there. We've all been in that same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper, listen, and do away with the whole lot of us. But instead, Paul is saying, but instead, immense in mercy and with incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on His own with no help from us. Then He picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus our Messiah. If you continue past that, 7, 8, 9, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it talks about the grace of God, how we did nothing to earn salvation, but by His grace, we are saved through faith. How good is it that even the writer is saying, I I'm surprised that God didn't lose His temper and just get rid of all of us. Can you imagine if God was um, not a second chance God? Can you imagine if God's grace wasn't as abundant as the Word of God says? If He wasn't immense in, in mercy? If He wasn't like that? Can you imagine where our lives would be? Can you imagine if God said, I'm only giving you maybe like, maybe like two, three chances at the most. But if you, after that, that's it, you're done. You're out of here. That wrong thought, that sin, that mistake, those words, that anger. Th that's it, two or three times. No, no, no. The Bible says immense, rich in mercy and in grace and in love. What? Slow to fulfill His promises, to send Jesus back to us, to delay it, to say that I still want you to come back and repent so you can have a life with me. That is the goodness of God, that not only does He notice you, but if you ever do walk away or if you do fall short, listen, He misses you. And you're saying, well, where does it say that, Eric? Let me, let me give you a really good example. One of my favorite stories, if not my favorite, Luke 15, the prodigal son. Once again, I'll paraphrase it. Very simple. There was a father and he had two sons. And one of the sons decided that he wanted his inheritance early. And so he told the father, can you give me my inheritance early? And the father, you know, was thinking like, well, okay. So the father grants him his wish and the son takes all of his money. And the Bible says that he goes off and he just lives a a wild life of sin, of nonsense. And he spends all of his money. And the Bible says he's, he's, he spends all of his money that he ends up being broke. And he's, he's basically homeless. And he goes and he tries to find work. And he ends up finding work with, with someone. And the, the Bible says that he ends up uh, in a pig's pen. And he's so hungry that he, he's eating the slop of the pigs. And then he's reminded of his father. At least I had a place to stay with my dad. At least I had food to eat with my dad. And the Bible says that he gets up out of the pig's pen and he begins to journey on his way home. We're talking about how your heavenly father misses you when you're away, when you walk away, when you run away, when you sin and fall short and feel like you're unworthy and you don't want to serve God because you're embarrassed of what you did or what has happened. When, that, when you're feeling like that, God is saying, I miss you and I love you so much. And the son makes his way home. And the Bible Bible says in Luke 15, 
verses 20, 21, he says this. He says, when he was still a long way off, this is the son that is walking home. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. I love this. Let me say that one more time so we can understand the context of what we're reading. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him, church. Do you understand that his father was looking for him, was waiting for his return? The only way that his dad can see him from a long way off is if his dad was actually looking and waiting and searching for him to return home. Why? Because his dad missed him. Because that was his son. And regardless of what his son did and the choices that his son made, his dad was there ready to love and to forgive and to even honor him and to welcome him back. And his father saw him from a long way out. His heart pounding, the message translation says, his heart pounding with excitement, with love. He ran out. He embraced him and he kissed him. Do you understand that in the first century, this is not what men did. Men did not run, nor did they embrace or kiss their sons. It's just not the way it worked in the first century. But yet here we have this unusual father that missed and loved his son so much that gave his son what he wanted and his son went and did everything wrong but yet his son realized that he can come back to his father and his father was waiting for him, saw him from a long way off. His heart was pounding. The Bible says that he ran to his son, that he embraced him and he kissed him. All the things that men did not do in the first century, this son, this father did with his son that he loved so much. Why? Because he missed him. He missed him and he, he wanted him back. And the Bible says that the son started his speech that he rehearsed on his way home. And he said, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. And I know we've all been there, church. We've all been in that moment in our minds where we're telling God, God, I, I messed up. I blew it. I, I made a mistake. I, I said something. I did something. I fell short, God. I don't deserve to be called your son. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your forgiveness. I love what the scripture goes on to say. The Bible says that the father just ignored him. The father's like, I don't want to hear it. You're home. I love you. You're back. Let's have a party. I want to welcome you back. To paraphrase this even shorter and a little bit less for us, the Bible says that he was just so excited that his son was once lost, but now he's found. His son was once dead, but now he's alive. Why? Because he was back with his father who missed him. Church, I promise you, no matter what has gone on in your life, another reason to be grateful is that God loves you so much that God misses you. And when you turn back to Him, oh, just like this Father, God is ready. He's ready to run out. He's ready to wrap His arms around you, embrace you, and kiss you and tell you, look, you, you can tell me all about it. You can ask for forgiveness and repent. Tell me all about it. But I just want you to know, I'm just glad you're back with me. I'm just glad you're back in my home where I can take care of you. Let's honor you. Let's put the clean robe on you. Let's put the ring on your finger. Let's get the shoes out. Let's get the, let's get the fatted calf. Let's have a party. My son is home. He was lost, but now he is found. The consistency of God's love, listen, is proven in his ability to not change his mind about you. Over and over again. God's grace abounds. Where sin abounds, man, God's grace abounds much, much, much more. And you need to understand that this is the God that we serve. A loving God, a gracious God, a God that says when you walk away, when you're running, when you've made a mistake, when you fell short, when you sinned, don't run further from me, run back to me. And yes, I will be there with my arms wide open and I have not changed my mind about you. I have not changed my mind about what I have for you or what I want for you or the purpose that I have for you. Man, it reminds me of myself again, church. I've been there. And I know many of you have been, you've been there as well. You've been there and some of you that, that maybe you're listening and you're watching, you're saying, gosh, that's me. I'm, I'm, I'm away from God. I just want you to know you can, you can turn around and your heavenly father will be there to love and to forgive and to pick you back up and to clean 
all the mess of the slop of a pig's pen off of you to dress you, to clothe you, and to change you. You are missed, church. I want you to know that. If you're watching this and you've been away, I want you to know from, from us here at HD Church, we love you and we miss you guys. You're more than welcome. These doors are always open for you to come back. This gospel message that we preach, man, we're doing our best to live it out. I want you to know if anything has gone wrong, if you've been offended or hurt in any way, we love you so much. And we're, we're sorry if we've, if we've missed it or we fell short or we overlooked you. I want you to know we, we do notice and we do miss. We love you guys very much. And my last point, my last point is this. You're blessed. Number three is this. You, you are blessed. And you know, being, being blessed is always determined by your perspective. Once again, there's a story in the Bible, and I'm paraphrasing these stories for time's sake, but there's such good stories that go with what we're talking about. Acts chapter 16. You could just write that down, go back and read it on your, your own. The Apostle Paul and his friend Silas, they're walking through a city. This is a, a very interesting story. They're walking through a city and they're preaching the gospel and, and, and a psychic, a fortune teller comes up to them, this woman, and just begins to harass them, begins to annoy and harass them, follows them around the city and just begins to tell everyone they, these guys are, you know, the, the preachers, the prophets, they're preaching about Jesus. They're just, she's just on and on. And, and, and let me just say this, she's, she really is a legit psychic fortune teller, but it's not from God. Paul turns around, he gets so frustrated with, with this woman that he, he turns around and he casts that, that demon that was inside of her, out of her. And the Bible goes on to say that, that word gets back to this fortune teller's masters and they're so upset because this woman made them a lot of money because she was legit. Demon possessed fortune telling skills. And the Bible says that, that, that the masters were so mad because she, she was making them so much money. And, and Paul goes in and casts this demon out of her and sets her free. And now she doesn't have the, the skill anymore. And so the masters call on the authorities. The authorities pick up Paul and Silas. They arrest them. They accuse them of whatever they accuse them of. And they take them into the town square and they beat them down. The Bible says they beat them black and blue. And then they throw them in prison. Now, this is my favorite part of the story because you being blessed is not about what you have. It's about who you have because being blessed is all about perspective. Paul and Silas just got arrested. He, 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 here's followers of Jesus doing the gospel work. They just get arrested. They get beaten. Black and blue, the Bible says. They get thrown in jail, and here they are in jail, and the Bible says that they're singing and praying. They're singing songs to Jesus, and they're praying while they're in prison, facing charges, getting ready to, to see the judge on the charges that are filed against them. Here's Paul and Silas, not down and out, not all mad about their situation, not upset because of what had happened, not angry at God saying, we were doing your work, Lord, and look at what happened to us. No, no, no. They're singing songs of praise. And they're crying out and praising and praying to God. And the Bible says that the earth began to shake. And a great earthquake hit and every single jail cell, prison door flung open. And every prisoner was able to, to, to be free and get out. And the, and the prison guard, the Bible says, the prison guard was so scared in that moment that he got his sword and he was getting ready to just take himself out because all the prisoners were, were going to get out. But then Paul and Silas called out to him and he said, hey, 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 we're here. We're not going anywhere. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that that prison guard took Paul and Silas in, took, took them to his house, loved on them, cleaned them up, fed them. The prison guard and his whole family were saved that night. And they couldn't wait, the Bible says, that they wanted to be baptized. And Paul and Silas baptized him and his whole family that night. You're not blessed because of what you have, church, you're blessed because of who you have and your ability to 
have an attitude of gratitude and to be grateful, it's all about your perspective. You see, Paul and Silas could have easily been upset with what took place. But yet, yet, yet no, there they were. They, they got, if we understand the context of this, think about this. They were arrested, wrongly, wrongly arrested and, and accused. Then they were beaten, like beaten, black and blue. They got beat really good. And then they were thrown in prison. And yet their confession never changed. They were singing and praising God. And here comes the God of miracles, our miraculous God that comes in and, and literally bails them out. And it doesn't end there. Paul and Silas continue their mission. And a whole family comes to know Jesus. And I love Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. It says this, it says, out of the message says, You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and His rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you'll find yourselves being cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. How amazing is it that Paul and Silas did not allow the troubles of this world to pull them away from God. They allowed it to drive them deeper into relationship with God. And church, that's got to be us. Did you notice that there was not one scripture that I read where it said, you're blessed because you have an amazing job. You're blessed because your bank accounts are just full of money. That's why you're, you're blessed because you drive a nice car and you're blessed because you live in a nice home. Let me just say something. I feel blessed because I do have those things, but I know that's not why I'm blessed. I know that does not define me being blessed. Being blessed is a state of mind. It's, it's the way you think. It's the way you see. It's the way you see the gospel. It's the way you see yourself. It's the way you see the world. That's how you determine whether you're blessed or not. Why? Because your whole life, all hell could break loose in your life and you can still have an attitude of gratitude. You could still be grateful. You could say, God, I was doing your work and yet here I am. They arrested me. They beat me. They threw me in prison. But yet here I am. I'm singing songs of praise. Why? Because I trust you. I believe in you. You said it over and over. You say it in your word. You're not not going to leave me. You're not going to forsake me. You will be with me through the end of time. You said it. Troubles and trials and tribulations are going to come my way, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world for you, God. So I put my trust in you. And now, God, I'm just thanking you. I'm thanking you. I'm blessed because, because of you, not because of anything that you've given me. Like I'm thankful for that, but that's not why I'm blessed. I'm blessed because I have you, Jesus. Because you saved me and you've forgiven me and there's not one other person on this earth that can ever have ever done that for me. And you noticed me. You didn't overlook me. You didn't pass me up. When everyone else did, you continue to see me for who I really was in my worst. And yet you still love me and you pick me back up. And when I walked away from you, when I was running away from you, there you were looking for me, trying, trying to get my attention. And then when I turned back towards you, you ran to me. And you embraced me and you kissed me and you gave me a new life. Church, if you cannot find reasons to be grateful, I pray that you find reasons to be grateful in what we just talked about today. You're blessed. Whether you believe that or not, you are blessed. That is why being humble is so important because humility, it helps us stay simple. Now, I, let, me, let me say something. I love traveling, and I, and I told last week how my wife and I went to Seattle, and we had a really great time, but, but you know what? That's not why I'm blessed. Truthfully, 
Like, give us ramen and a rerun and we'll have a good time. It's not a big deal. Like, we're, we're just, we're blessed because we have Jesus. We're blessed because we've been saved, because God has forgiven us, because God has given us a new um, opportunity, a new chance, a second and third chance, a fourth and fifth chance, a sixth and seventh and a hundredth chance to get things right. That's why we are blessed. So church, begin to understand why you're blessed. Stop letting the world impress you so much. It's, it's not that, it's not worth it. There's so much darkness going on. Quit letting, quit letting the world impress you and, and then the world won't impress on you. You stay focused to what God is calling you to do and you remind yourself that I'm noticed, that I'm missed, and that I'm blessed. Church, I love you guys. Um, don't forget, next Sunday, We'll be back 10 a.m. in-person service, continuing on our series, Better Than I Deserve. And then, man, that is the truth. When I think about that, God, you have given us a life better than we deserve, and we're, we should be thankful for it. Amen, church. I pray that you um, were blessed by that message. Let's get ready to receive um, our Sunday's tithes and offerings. Prepare your hearts. The Bible says to, to be prepared, you know, already beforehand. You know, the Bible says that to give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down shaken together and running over you know when it uh, refers to that it's referring to the first century when the uh, people would go shopping they would wear these big sacks over like like overalls and then they would go into the market and they would get grain or beans or rice and they would fill it as much as they could and then they would shake it like that good measure pressed down and shaken together and be running over the bible says the Bible says that when, when you give, it's like that. That God honors when we give, that God opens doors, that God, that God continually just increases us in so many ways. And so I want to encourage you to, to make that commitment and that covenant relationship with God. You're going to say, God, I'm, I'm going to sow into my local church. I'm going to sow into your kingdom. I'm going to give. I'm going to help build. I want to be a part of what's going on. And you said that when I give, it will be given back unto me. Generosity begets generosity, the Bible says. And so I'm, I'm telling you, I've never met um, a generous person that was poor. Once again, let's talk about how being blessed is a state of mind. You're blessed for a lot of reasons, church. We appreciate you guys giving. And uh, let's pray over today's tithes and offerings and the message. Father, I thank you. Lord, once again, Lord, for your word that has gone forth. Thank you for noticing us, God. Thank you for being with us, not overlooking us, not passing us up, Lord. But you've been there with us from the very beginning, Lord. Even when we didn't even know it, you were with us. Your hand was upon us, God. And thank you for not abandoning us, Lord. When we walk away, when we miss it, when we fall short, Lord, you miss us. You're looking for us. You're waiting for our return. And I'm thankful that we can always come back to you and make things right with you. And you put us and set us back on the path that you have for us, God. And thank you. Help us to understand why we're blessed. Not because of what we have, but because of who we have. And that's you, Jesus. And now I thank you, Lord, for everyone that is given, Lord. My prayer is that, that we are giving with a cheerful heart, God. That we are giving because we love you. That we want to seek your kingdom first, God, and understand that all the, every other thing will be added unto us as long as we put you first. So I thank you, Lord, for the people that have sowed, that are giving, Lord. I just pray that you continue to bless them, increase them in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.